This is how we do an Air Force flyover from a pilot's perspective. Welcome, my name is Hazard. I'm a fighter pilot for the Air Force. I spent the first half of my career flying the F-16. Now I fly the F-35. So flyovers are something we do from time to time. Here's a video of me from 2018 leading the Phoenix Open flyover. As always, if you're enjoying this content, make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. All right, so the first question to answer is why. So why are we doing a flyover? So a flyover is a chance for us to showcase what you are spending your hard-earned tax dollars on. So I know there's always a lot of criticism out there that flyovers cost a lot of money, but in reality, it takes about 10, 15 minutes for us to do the flyover, and then afterwards, we can work on tactical training. And actually the flyover itself is pretty helpful for us. So as fighter pilots, it's absolutely critical to be able to meet a TOT, a time over target, especially in a dynamic environment like a flyover. So it actually gives us pretty good training. So we treat these missions just like any other. So we will show up uh, about an hour and a half, two hours before our takeoff time. We will brief up the mission. Afterwards, we will put on our gear, step out to the jets, start them up, get to the end of the runway, wait for our takeoff time, We'll blast, show up about 10, 15 minutes early for the event, do the flyover, and then go into the tactical airspace, work on our mission, and then we will land. Afterwards, we will do a full-up fighter pilot debrief. So we will spend uh, you know, an hour and a half, two hours debriefing the, the whole mission uh, on what we can do better. All right, so once we have the flyover request, and that goes through a whole bunch of levels of approval, so you can't get it for your 4th of July cookout, which is what I've seen before actually. So usually these are like NFL stadiums, we'll coordinate with the venue, and usually they're used to flyovers. So they have a direction they want us to fly from based on camera angles, based on the crowds. So it's pretty easy to rinse and repeat what people have done before. Uh, for the Phoenix Open, there had only been one to my knowledge in the last 20 years. So they didn't really know what they wanted. So I actually went out to the venue work with them to find exactly where they wanted me to do the flyover, what direction they wanted me to come from, made sure there are no obstacles or any other issues, and then was able to coordinate that with the airspace out there. So Phoenix is actually one of the busiest airspaces in the world. So International Airport, just about 10 miles south, Sky Harbor. So we had to work around the Class B, Class Bravo airspace out there. Um, so as you can see up here, so the airspace uh, starts at 6,000 feet, goes to 9,000 feet, and there's some mountains out there at 2,000 feet. So what that means is that we have about, uh, about 3,000 feet to work with. Now you also see that Scottsdale Airport is out there. So we were flying directly through Scottsdale Airport's airspace. So we coordinated with them to make sure that we could fly through at the time that they requested and they were extremely helpful. So that really wasn't an issue for them to be able to hold up traffic for just a few minutes while we flew through there. Next, as a squadron, we will coordinate our takeoff times. So typically squadrons will have two goes. So 10 aircraft will blast, they'll do their mission, they'll come back, maintenance will turn them, do all their maintenance uh, that's required, and then refuel them, and then they'll take off again. So maintenance really doesn't wanna to have to duplicate a lot of that work, so we will align all the goes to make sure that we can support that flyover. All right, so the day of, we briefed up, we took off, we arrived about 10 to 15 minutes early. So that's really the sweet spot, 10, 15 minutes. That's much better than showing up even 10 seconds late. As a fighter pilot, you wanna do everything that you can early so that you can avoid that in-game thrash. Once we arrived, we set up about a 10 nautical mile hold. So we were about 10 miles from the venue holding east-west for about 10 mile legs. So 10 miles is pretty good. It gives you time to descend down to altitude. Remember you're in a four ship, so there's a lot of people out there that have to respond to whatever you're doing. So you wanna give them time to close in in game and for you to be able to descend, find the, uh, the target that you're flying over, all those different things. You can collapse that down to five miles, but 10 miles is a comfortable run in for one of these flyovers. All right, so now the most important part, the timing. So the timing for these things is extremely important. So usually these are at the end of a national anthem. So if they know exactly when we wanna do the flyover, so to the second, that's generally pretty easy for us. So these are venues, these are events, timing changes drastically often just a few minutes prior. So we will have somebody on the ground that is coordinating with the event coordinator to update any timing. Now, typically they will have a radio that they can talk to us with. However, we were doing a hold about 10 miles away. There are mountains in the way as well. So 
we elected to have them call Scottsdale Airport and then Scottsdale Airport with their powerful radios could relay any information to us. That was a dual function as well because it would allow them to clear us through their airspace. So we have multiple radios in that 35, so we were monitoring Scottsdale uh, Airport, we were monitoring Sky Harbor, as well as we had our own in-flight aux, so we can monitor a lot of different radios at the same time. So the national anthem typically takes about two minutes to sing. However, uh, singers have a big variance in how long they take to, to sing. I think we're all familiar with some Super Bowl singers that hold every note and it takes forever. So we'll have someone the day before show up and they'll time how long it takes the singer to sing the national anthem. Now the day of, sometimes these singers get nervous and it collapses how long it takes for them to sing. So the day before, whoever we have listening to the singer will have time marks throughout the song. So the day of, they can see are they ahead of time or behind time and they can pass that information to us. All right, so about three to four minutes prior to the flyover, we got words from the guy that was on the ground that our TOT time over target was gonna be, call it 17, 15, 27. So that's in Zulu time. And so I'm looking on my PCD panoramic cockpit display. So I have an estimated time over target based on my current airspeed. And so I turn cold and then about 45 seconds prior is when I turn hot. So 45 seconds is how long it takes for us to turn 180 degrees pretty comfortably. At low altitude, that's actually pretty conservative. But again, as a fighter pilot, you want to be early as opposed to being late because you can float the outside of the turn. So we rolled out about plus or minus five seconds and then we were able to adjust our airspeed to uh, shack the estimated timing. So the most important thing is deconfliction. These venues are incredibly busy. There are a lot of drones. There are a lot of Cessnas flying around. Now they shouldn't be flying in there. It's a temporary flight restriction, but that often doesn't stop them from doing it. So deconfliction is the most important thing. Looking out, scanning with your radar, we actually had a problem with a balloon that was flying directly over our flight path. And so we had a couple options. We could either abort the pass, we could check down to the south, we could fly over the balloon, uh, which was flying at about three to 4,000 feet. The terrain is 1,500 feet and we were doing a thousand foot pass. So we actually had enough room to fly underneath the balloon, but it was definitely a, bit of an in-game thrash to figure out what we were going to do. All right, in the last couple miles, it's about just being as stable as possible. Now, there's sometimes a debate, AB or no AB, so that's afterburner. I did a video before. I'll make sure to link it above on what afterburner is, but the short answer is it's when we spray fuel into our exhaust and ignite it. And with the F-35, the Pratt & Whitney F-135 engine, you can feel it just ripping the air apart, so you can feel it in your chest. So Usually people like to hear that on the ground, um, but it's more difficult to stay in formation. So especially for the wingmen out there that are trying to stay in close formation, you don't have the finesse ability with the throttle that you do uh, in sub afterburner. So my rule as a four ship, I'll leave it in sub AB. If it's a two ship and I'm with an experienced wingman, and we have a nice stable run in, then we'll do a little bit of afterburner in game. All right, so after that, we climbed it up, contacted Sky Harbor, got vectors back to Luke. We still had a lot of extra fuel, so we went into the MOA military operating area, and then we uh, worked on tactics after that, landed, and then debriefed the sortie. So that was the, uh, the flyover. It's not something we do all the time, but it does give you a chance to practice some of those mental muscles that you don't get a chance to use day to day. So it's pretty good for building airmanship. All right, so if you enjoyed this, make sure to like it, subscribe, turn on notifications. I have a, a awesome video coming to you in the next week or so. Uh, I had a chance to go to the F-35 factory. And so they have over 200 F-35s that are being built simultaneously in a building that's over a mile long. The one thing that surprised me is the, the factory is incredibly quiet. So I have a video walking the line, you'll get a chance to see that uh, hopefully next week, maybe the week after, but make sure to subscribe so you don't miss that. All right, talk to you next time.